We're here to finally answer the most asked question from the fantasy readers of the past 20 years. Should I read Gardens of the Moon? And the answer is yes, but I will try to help you adjust your approach to this book so that you can enjoy it and don't get frustrated by the experience. Because especially if you are a fantasy reader, this book is an important part of fantasy literature and chances are you already tried to read it once but couldn't get past the first few chapters. If you're like me and watch tons of reviews, that kept saying this book is only for hardcore fantasy fans. It doesn't hold your hand. It is not for everyone or any type of cryptic stuff. First of all, I'll show you a book that doesn't hold your hand. Okay, this book doesn't hold your hand. What the fuck is even this? Gardens of the Moon? It's fine. And we'll get to that later, but like me, after watching all those reviews, if you're still like, I get that the book won't hold my hand, I'm not trying to have a romantic relationship with it, but what the fuck is Gardens of the Moon about? Well, let's start with that. Gardens of the Moon is the first book of the 10 book series Malazan Book of the Fallen. Malazan is the name of the empire. And at the beginning of this book, their emperor gets overthrown. The new empress wants to conquer all the cities, but there's one city, Darugistan, still standing. She sends a squad to infiltrate the city, but there are other forces that are against the empress. One of these forces is a small crew in Darugistan, but there are also other powerful beings and even gods involved in changing the course of events in their own favors. So in its most basic form, the Empire wants to take a city from the inside, you have a group of characters infiltrating the city, another group defending it, and everything that happens in between. There is a variety of problems in the narrative style of this book that causes all sorts of issues. So let me tell you, it's not you, it's the book, but to help you enjoy this book, I made a five point numbered list because I think this book might be worth the effort. Number one on the list is characters. Now, as you might have realized, I kept referring to the characters in groups because there are so many characters in this book. You have no idea. I don't think I've ever seen any book with this many viewpoint characters. At some point, a crow is a viewpoint character or a hound or any random person. This is the first difficulty while reading this book, figuring out who is main and who is not. It's hard to figure out who to follow and for the most part, there's no single main character and it makes it really hard to form a connection with this book. But it is how it is and you will have to accept it before you read this book. Also, their names are super weird, like Genoes or Tattersail or someone is even named Sorry. Now, I do have some tips. Pay attention to the viewpoint characters early on. Pay attention to the characters in the Empire Squad when you get to the City of Pale. And once you get to Darigistan, the book will introduce you to the characters in the other group one by one in separate sections. So pay attention to those. Also, pay attention to the Lord of the Moon. It sounds obvious, but it's not. There is a sort of flying enclave called the Moon, and it has a powerful Lord, and he is important. So even just these are like 15 average characters to keep track of. Unfortunately, the characters are not the strong point of this book, so try to focus more on the events and try to enjoy the world and the lore around the characters more than the characters themselves. Sometimes I even mistook one character for another because they can be very basic and the complicated names don't help. Overall, if complex characters and their complex relationships is more important than anything for you, this book is not for you. Number two, Viewpoint. This is the first novel of this author under this pen name. So it is an early work and it is extremely ambitious for an early work. So the narrative choices can be somewhat confusing. First of all, there are many sections within the chapters and they're not labeled but often each section means you are changing viewpoints. Since the sections are not labeled, there's no way of knowing whose viewpoint you're in. Worst of all, there's no way of knowing if it's a new character or someone you already know. And something that this book does is it sometimes holds back the name of the viewpoint character for a few pages, which is absolutely pointless to me, especially if it's a character you've never even heard of. So you go like, oh, okay, 
it was a completely new person. Whenever you're getting confused who the viewpoint is, you just have to push through. Then sometimes it might help to backtrack and reread the section once you know who the viewpoint is. If you are a writer watching this video, please don't do this. If you have a lot of viewpoint characters, either just label your chapters or reveal the name in the first few sentences, unless it's actually a character everyone has been talking about and the reader is finally in that character's viewpoint and you want to have a particular experience revealing the name. If you already know the character or if it's a completely new character, just reveal the name early on. Which brings us to number three on the list, time and space. I believe this is again related to this being an early work, but the number one reason readers get confused in any type of writing really, even in writing lyrics, is because they don't know who is speaking, as in the previous point about the viewpoint, but also they don't know where and when we are. This book has so many time jumps and they are very inconsistent. Sometimes you have something happen, then you get to the next section, but that next section is actually happening at the same time with the previous section, but at a different place. And that information is revealed in a somewhat unclear way. You do realize at some point while reading the chapter, and I do believe some of them are supposed to have an effect by holding the reveal until the end. But again, the effect of the reveal is so minor compared to the confusion the reader will have while reading. If you are a writer, please make sure you convey the time and space information early on on your chapters. Just like the viewpoint, if you're getting confused where and when you are, you might need to push through and then backtrack if necessary. Unfortunately, this book will not repeat important information, which is number four on the list, exposition. The way this book conveys information can be confusing. Normally, let's say six years have passed, and you are going to have a character say something to convey that information to the readers. You would just have the character say, it's been six years since whatever. This book chooses to say, it's been many years. Now, if you are going to have a character say it, just have them say the exact thing so we know exactly when we are. The information is sometimes conveyed through a long history lesson reading books, and other times it's extremely lacking, which makes it very hard to follow, but most of the time it is there. I think that's one thing why people say it doesn't hold your hand, as in an experienced writer would make sure the important information is emphasized and reiterate it. I believe it's part of the writer's job. Clarity in writing is extremely important to me and it is an important part of the craft of writing. This book doesn't really concern itself much with it. Do not read this book with the audiobook at double speed. Actually, you should read this book much slower than your regular speed and you should accept that you might want to backtrack every now and then. Now, after all this, why are we trying so hard to read this fucking thing, you might ask? And that's number five world building. The world building in this book is unlike anything I've ever seen. The places, the races, the species, the races of different species, the races of different species who have different lifestyles, the variety in magic, the rich history. It feels like this is a world that has been lived in. It is so interesting whenever you meet a completely new creature. That discovery is so incredibly satisfying that if you love world building, you will love this book. The primary way you enjoy this book is to just enjoy the world unravel in front of you. Most characters have no idea what's going on. They have very limited info about the world. Just allow yourself to take the ride with them. Let yourself be amazed and awed by all the gods and powerful wizards and strange creatures you meet. I can't say I understand the magic system of this book. It seems very random, but basically there are, I want to say, dimensions? called warrens that you might have a connection to. And depending on what warren you have a connection to, you draw a certain power. But it is super vague. I'm guessing it will be explored in the next books. Also, here's a bonus tip. There are epigraphs at the beginning of each chapter. And by all means, go ahead and read them. Some say they made sense in the second read through, but I say you can just skip them. I don't think I understood any of them. Anyway, I hope this video was helpful. This is a very difficult, complicated book to talk about. Let me know if you start or restart the book after watching this video. I must admit, even though I enjoyed the book, it was a difficult read and I just am not sure if I want to read the next books because I truly, genuinely, 
do not care about any of the characters one small bit. It also suffers quite a bit from one of my most hated tropes in fantasy, Back from the Dead. But guess what? I didn't even care about the character that died in the first place and I didn't care when they came back. Well, that's it for this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like to let me know. And if you want more numbered bookish lists, don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you in the next one. I am commonplace. I am commonplace. I am shy.